This episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Whether it's espresso machines, manual brewing devices, or general coffee shop needs, they seek to pursue the most innovative coffee products, both domestic and abroad, to offer their customers. Find out more at prima-coffee.com. This is Keys to the Shop, episode 72, Taking an Origin Trip, with Kim Elena Ionescu. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. Always happy to have you along, and it's going to be a good one today, talking about the origin trip. Um... Good information, good points made in this episode. I think you're going to find it really interesting. Uh, Before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsor here at Keys to the Shop, and that is Prima Coffee. Uh, If you don't know, Prima Coffee is a specialty coffee equipment supplier, and they're based out of Louisville, Kentucky, right here where the show is based. And ever since the beginning of their company, they have set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public. And their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need, from grinders to espresso machines to undercounter refrigeration. Uh, whether your need is uh, for home equipment or commercial, they pretty much have everything you need at prima coffee.com. Go to that website, prima coffee.com, see what they have to offer. It's a lot. And they also have a lot of resources there that you can peruse, um, best ways to use the equipment, uh, troubleshooting guides, uh, brew recipes and comparisons, all sorts of stuff. They really put a big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. I vouch for them. I've used them for years and I love what they do. So go to prima-coffee.com and reach out, see what they can do for you or your business. And my thanks to Prima for their support of Keys to the Shop, as well as supporting us as an industry by giving us the tools we need to do our jobs well. Now, I also want to say, if you have not already, would you consider subscribing to Keys to the Shop as well as uh, sharing the show or an episode with a friend who you think would benefit from it? Uh, There's a lot of great expertise collected in the 70 or so episodes that we have so far. Um, Industry experts from all corners of the globe and of the specialty coffee profession. And the uh, point of the show is to really help people working in retail, specialty retail, uh, grow themselves in their careers. And having the show shared with them by a friend is the number one way that people discover keys to the shop. So that would be really awesome if you do that. And lastly, remember, you have the opportunity when you go to keystotheshop.com, a box will pop up and ask you for your email. If you do that, you'll get a newsletter weekly that'll have the show notes for each episode, as well as helpful links, uh, both things that are mentioned in the episode, as well as uh, supporting resources for the topic of the episode, and, uh, and also updates and news about keys to the shop and things going on with uh, keys to the shop. So yeah, real simple, just enter your email address and the way you go. So today we are talking about origin trips. Importers, cuppers, baristas, and roasters alike, all of them make the trip to origin uh, for various reasons. And we have seen travel to farms emerge more and more as an established part of the culture in, in specialty coffee to where now it's just known as the origin trip. It's its own thing. So um, you know, our Instagrams are filled with images of groups and individuals at the farm, um, in the lab with rolls, rows of cupping bowls, you know, smiling ecotourists with baskets half filled with cherries, you know, local kids playing in the coffee fields. It certainly is a envied scene and it makes us want to go there ourselves. And I've been myself once to Nicaragua, a very brief farm visit in a time when I was teaching at uh, Rama Cafe uh, event that was sometime back in 2008 but it was as brief as it was it was also very surreal and yeah a deeply moving experience as a person who works in coffee going to origin it's one of the most coveted things in our industry and we all want an opportunity to go where it started you know to go to the place that gives us the ability to do what we do but what's the purpose of an origin trip 
How does it impact our career or our business? You know, what about the effect on the farm? Is it a waste of money or is it time well spent? And are there pitfalls or, or assumptions that we can make that actually hinder the effort of sustainability and quality? These are some questions that have been asked and some brief but recent discussion online has made me want to explore it a little bit more. And so I'm pleased today that we're going to get some answers to some of these questions because we're talking with none other than Kim Elena Ionescu. So Kim is the Chief Sustainability Officer for the SCA, or the Specialty Coffee Association, and in her role there as the CSO, uh, she raises awareness and develops strategy and leads action to address the biggest social, environmental, and economic challenges facing the specialty industry. And uh, prior to joining the association in 2015, Kim spent a decade buying coffee, and directing sustainability for counterculture coffee in North Carolina. Kim is one of the industry's greatest minds, and she believes that sustainability must be firmly embedded in every stage of the coffee value chain, as you'll see in this conversation about origin trips. Um, you know, this is a really a good time to talk about this, too, because origin trips are part of the prize you get as a barista. And competitions are kind of ramping up right now with coffee champs down in New Orleans just uh, finishing up. So I think today's chat is going to be pretty helpful. Kim delivers a lot of value here. So let me bring you right to my conversation with the chief sustainability officer of the SCA, Kim Elena Ionescu. All right, Kim, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Really pleased to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, um, we have quite a topic to talk about today, and uh, you are just the person to talk to about this um, as the Chief Sustainability Officer at the SCA. Uh, before we get started, like right into the topic, I mean, I kind of want to know a, a little bit more about your journey into uh, your career now in coffee. And if you could talk to us briefly about how you decided to pursue coffee to make this like your career, what were the biggest influences on your career that kind of drove you to the place you are today? Yeah. So, you know, I would say that my decision to pursue a career in coffee, like, like a lot of people of my coffee generation, I don't remember there being a moment where I decided that this was going to be my career. And, you know, I met you early on in my career when I was working at Counterculture Coffee in Durham, North Carolina in around 2004. It was still a pretty small company. And I had gotten there by way of uh, being a barista. So I had some interest in coffee and, and coffee was at the intersection of all of these things I was interested in, like sustainability, although I'm not even sure I called it that back then. It was more like uh, the environment and conservation or um, social justice issues and uh, and Latin America. So I, I was definitely interested in coffee, but it was still pretty vague to me, the idea that I could have a career in coffee and also in all of those aspects of it that fascinated me. I was working a job as a, a customer support representative for counterculture, and um, I think it was through that job and, and many of the people that I met, you know, like uh, um, people that I continue to work with now, like Cindy Ludwigson and Peter Giuliano, um, that I began to see all of these different career possibilities and avenues opening up. Nice. It was a great crew. And I remember meeting you all there. I was doing some yeah. kind of latte art uh, demonstration. Latte art. <laughs> yeah, it was latte art. Yeah, those are the days. And so you were into sustainability, uh, although you didn't call it that. You were already into those types of uh, topics and that was in your heart to pursue already. Yeah, I think, you know, I was actually thinking about this the other day and how I did a study abroad program in college and I went to Chile, which is not a coffee producing country. Um, and so I, although I didn't learn about coffee there specifically, I remember it being the first time prior to that study abroad experience, I really thought that I wanted to teach high school English classes and maybe Spanish classes because I, I was taking Spanish and I liked that. And I really loved literature, but I didn't ever think so much about literature as a sort of a vehicle to learn about politics. And in that semester, I felt like that was the first time that I really began to connect um, literature that I loved with all of these sort of environmental, social, political 
circumstances that um, that surrounded it. And I think about that kind of informing my entry into coffee too, that I liked coffee. I thought coffee was interesting, but it was really the fact that it was this vehicle for all of these other sort of influences. Like how did it come to be this way? Why is coffee like this? And And I think that matched up really well with the um, the narratives around why does coffee taste this way and so much of, uh, of the interest of my, you know, my coffee mentors and my coffee peers and the specialty coffee industry and, uh, and community in the early 2000s. So, um, so while a lot of people were talking about why coffee tastes this way, I think I was interested in that, but I, I was more interested even in like, um, but why are coffee farms this way and communities this way? And, and how does that all contribute to um, the way coffee tastes, but also the way coffee is bought and sold and the way that we talk about it and the way that um, we interact with it kind of beyond just the taste part? Right. There's a whole story behind, you know, not to be too cliche, every cup of coffee, um, every origin has just uh, the blood, sweat and tears of communities behind it. And so this fascination and this focus that you had on on this part of the industry uh, led you in, to make decisions that eventually put you in the position of chief sustainability officer. Yeah. What does that job entail? Oh, gosh. You know, so I came to a specialty coffee association from counterculture where I was a sustainability manager and uh, and also a coffee buyer in the later years and i um i think of my job now as uh, in some ways like magnifying what i was doing in the in the context of a single company and trying to sort of connect the relevance of a, a single company to now like 10,000 SEA members and beyond so some of the issues that a individual company might grapple with how does that fit into the bigger picture of the coffee industry, the specialty coffee industry, and then, you know, the coffee industry as it is most broadly defined. So we face all of these challenges as an industry, and we see those as, as individuals, but then, um, you know, some of those challenges are too big for us to act on alone. We may plant trees on an individual farm to um, mitigate the effects of climate change, but that sort of strategy isn't going to work on every farm. You know, that's not how we're going to um, ultimately ensure coffee's future and the, the adaptation of coffee overall. So, you know, how do we connect these individual actions to the um, kind of the greater goals that we all share without taking away the power of individual decisions and individual actions or the sort of competitive advantage that comes from um, innovating within the context of a supply chain or a relationship. Um, there are other, you know, there are other ways that we can act collaboratively or there are um, opportunities for the, you know, the association to be a convener of different perspectives or a, um, the, kind of a, the catalyst for some sort of collaboration that might not happen otherwise between competitors in the marketplace. So keeping your eye on the big picture and the long-term effects of individual action, but also the quality of those those actions in the right now. And uh, that sounds like a, a huge job to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of that part of the industry. I mean, how do you define sustainability? <laughs> oh, this is a favorite question. Um, it's right there uh, in the, it's right, it comes right after, um, how do you define specialty in the list of, uh, of frequently asked and unanswerable questions <laughs> for the OCA. <laughs> um, you know, this, this kills so many people, but I don't define it. I mean, the thing is that and I think it's more the word defining. It's like, it's not that I don't have sustainability beliefs or goals or, um, or sort of key focus areas, but part of the vastness of sustainability and part of the reason I guess that it seems so vast is because, um, I really, you know, I see this as it's not new conceptually, but it, it's so dynamic. Like we are asking people in the sustainability field to be willing to change basically if not everything, then anything like uh, because we are recognizing that 
what we're doing now is inherently not going to work in the future. So we have to be able to change it. So I feel like, you know, definition, it imposes this structure that I'm just like, I'm always so sure that we're going to, I want to keep that structure open. You know, I want to be able to say that what we were we, what we were doing 10 years ago in sustainability was the best that we were able to do then, but now we know better. Mm. So I feel like our, um, you know, that I can talk about a, a sort of a sustainability goal in which like coffee is valued um, and valuable to everyone who participates in the supply chain um, or in which coffee production is and you know provides environmental benefit. It's not just that it does the least possible harm, but that um, it actually could contribute positively to the environment in which it's it's grown. Um, but that's not a the definition of coffee isn't like a you know a carbon neutral coffee or something like like that because that that might be you know that might be an indicator that might be one way of achieving that goal or making progress toward it. But um, but yeah, I really uh, I really sort of buck against um, defining sustainability. Excellent. <laughs> no, that's I, I love that because if we're evolving and we are investigating and trying to problem solve, then yeah, you want to leave your options open and and not fall into some kind of you know category bias or or whatever. Um, you know, part of you know what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about going to origin. And it seems like that in particular, um, you see it in Instagram feeds, you see it, um, in videos and it's a prize in competitions to go to Mm -hmm. origin. It's something that's really, I feel like it's ramped up in the last few years as third wave coffee has grown and and our focus on sustainability too, because it seems like we want to investigate what's going on there. So what is behind this part of the retailer producer relationship? Like how did this start out? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that the probably the true oh gosh, the true origins of the origin trip <laughs> are um they date back a long time because I don't think that although this uh the sort of explosion of origin trips and or trips to coffee producing communities coincides with the growth of the um third wave in coffee uh i don't i know that that wasn't those weren't the first ones it's just that um uh, the first ones may not have looked so much like this or there would have been maybe fewer days spent on farms and more days spent tasting coffee in a lab in the whatever the city um, where the coffee was going to be exported from was like the port city, or it may have been a different person who was traveling to the farm. Um, someone say who worked for the exporter or the importer, as opposed to the roaster or the retailer. And, you know, there are so many different people now who go on, uh, go on trips to origin, including, you know, people from within the, the same country, the same, but who aren't coffee producers. You know, I, I think about a country like Brazil or even um, even Costa Rica that someone might go on an origin trip and and they could be from that country, but they don't know anything about coffee farming. You know, and they're mm-hmm. going to learn also. So um, I think that the you know in order to uh, to kind of talk about how it started then I would want to be a little bit more like clear about which definition, you know, I just, I just railed <laughs> against definitions, but which, um, which kind, like who's doing the the travel? Because I think that the, um, yeah, that roasters really started to do, uh, like a, there was sort of exponential growth in roaster travel to coffee producing communities, um, in the early two thousands. And because of my background and being a coffee buyer and working for a roaster. That's what I think of as an origin trip. But, mm-hmm. you know, now I work for the SCA and we have origin trips and those are not all roasters. And uh, and you mentioned the competition. So baristas are winning barista competitions on going on origin trips that are being organized by importers. But in each of those cases, I think that sort of the intention or the the goals of that trip and and kind of who, who started it and what the... Um, the, you know, the benefits and and problems might be differ somewhat. 
Yeah, you know, this this was something I think maybe it was a week and a half ago or two weeks that there was a, a little bit of a discussion about this on Twitter, on the old coffee Twitter. And uh, we were talking about, I think the original uh, comment was something to the effect of, you know, money being better spent elsewhere than plane mm-hmm. tickets and things like that. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, we've got these groups going. It sounded like it's business at first is how it started. Like, we're going to go, we're going to cup, we're going to buy, we're going to mm-hmm. leave. <laughs> and mm-hmm. now yeah. there's sort of, sort of this ecotourism aspect mm-hmm. to it. So there's this tension you're talking about origin trips. And, you know, on one hand, you want to be familiar with the farm and the farmers and other things like that. And then the other hand, there's this cost. And then there's like, do we see the ROI for the farmer? Maybe it feels exploitative. Um, Have you had this tension yourself? And and how do you, if you have, or how do you reconcile that? Oh, yeah. I have experienced that tension in many different ways over the years. And, um, you know, I think as a, to reference that coffee Twitter, hashtag coffee Twitter conversation about um, the, you know, the cost of it, that what that, that tweet, that conversation was, was criticizing or at least wanting to, to put some attention to was the, this idea that a, you know, a trip to origin is sort of beneficial for everyone in the supply chain, that it's really important to uh, producers to have a buyer come visit, that a buyer visit is some sort of investment in quality and the relationship. And that, um, you know, if we were to be honest about about this and, and get producer perspective on it in a way, um, and this sort of, I think there, it, it touches on how sometimes in our marketing language, we can talk about producers using words like partners, where it would imply that we make decisions together. And so if we were to do that, if we as buyers said, okay, let's ask our partners how we should spend the money associated with this trip, you know, like we're going to spend um, $3,000 on this trip between all of our travel and that, you know, time away from the business and everything. Um, is this a good investment of this $3,000? Or if we're in trying to invest in quality in the relationship, like what would you like to do with this uh, this money? Can we agree together um, what the best use of the money is? And um, and I think that would be more fair if if we're to see it as that kind of like investment. On the other hand, if we were to see it as a marketing cost, like we want to get beautiful pictures of a place that we buy coffee from, and we want to um, uh, have a great story to tell about our product that we believe will help sell the coffee, then that to me is much less problematic and uh, and much less. Um, yeah, it's it's not that it's more defensible, but the problem there isn't the trip itself. It's the way that we talk about it. And when we talk about it as some sort of gift that's being given or some sort of, um, you know, uh, act of um, of kindness or or charity or investment as partnership, that's more problematic than saying like, yeah, we're spending, you know, three thousand dollars on marketing and uh, and it's an expense that you know, we believe will be uniquely satisfied or, you know, there's value here and we're going to capture that value um, and justify the return through the additional sales of product. So being honest up front about your intentions sounds pretty important. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, yes, I think that that, uh, that that might actually address some of the, the critiques of the, the cost because you know, there is a cost associated with it. But I think that sometimes what people feel like what they're objecting to would be less about the the money itself and more about the idea that, like, you know, that this is somehow necessary and that um, that everyone wants this, needs this, that you as a, an individual or a buyer should be celebrated just for the fact that you have this additional stamp in your passport that proves that you have been to a particular place Mm -hmm. like that inherently raises the value of your product or of your coffee or of your brand or of your, um, you know, the legitimacy of what it is that you, you do. Is is there a dark side to that at all where maybe there is, uh, 
a point where somebody goes and they kind of pick cherries and they show a picture of them eating their first coffee cherry and uh, it all seems innocent. But is there is there a point at which it becomes a little bit uh, of a waste? I mean, because I feel like that's part of the um, between the lines language when we're talking about this or when there's, um, you know, we're, uh, for example, uh, pictures of farmers on coffee bags is something that is a topic that people are like, well, should mm-hmm. we market our coffee with the faces of people who don't make as much as we mm-hmm. do? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I feel uncomfortable with some of the um, the choices, including that I've made over the years about uh, using imagery of people without um, explicitly asking for their consent to mm-hmm. use their faces in promoting a product. Um, I look back on that and I wish I'd done it differently. I wish I'd asked. Um, I can also say that there was a, a recent panel um, discussion that I'm thinking of that uh, that reminded me that many producers actually would. No, there there is value in um, buyers to continue to visit us in part because it is time spending time together in person with anyone working with, whether that's a colleague or a, a trading partner, is is really invaluable. So there's that piece, and then also that it does um, raise the profile of the uh, farm, that it does, um, they also want to use techniques that help to sell their product. So it's, um, you know, it's not a, a total us-them dynamic where um, buyers are exploiting the, you know, photographs of and their children unwilling, you know, with, with no willingness there. Um, I just think that, the, you know, the, to me, the danger of the dark side is in that um, not examining it or not or sort of claim to be doing something altruistic when really it's not altruistic. It's, you know, it's a business decision. And if we if we approach it like this transaction and we put um, more structure in place around it, then we're probably going to end up doing a lot of the same things. I don't imagine that, you know, trips to coffee communities would plummet uh, or photograph availability would plummet or anything like that. It's just that um, in the absence of that, I think we run some risks to being called out, uh, you know, and to having someone say that wasn't fair and they'd, and they'd be right. But in most cases, I think it probably, you know, it may be done in good faith, but without standards or structure or something, we just, we don't know. Mm hmm. Well, it seems like going back to um, the concerns of your position and the long-term effects of decisions we make in the present moment, the return on the investment for something like taking photos, um, of course, with permission and um, really making much ado about the farm and the farmer and what's going on there in in selling more of that coffee is something you see down the line more. So maybe there's just more patience that's needed to see the process into its fruition. Yeah, I think it is. It's a, it requires, and, and some of this is, I think, especially challenging for people with an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, this idea that, you know, we have a, a small business, we're just a small company, we can't afford to do any of that, we don't have that legal infrastructure, we can't afford to do all of this, we're just trying to do the best that we can, and have the, you know, the best coffee and the best relationships that we can. And, um, and you know, I, I identify with, with all of that. And I, um, you know, I, especially within the the coffee association, seeing so many people who are at that stage and it's so exciting and there's so much possibility and you are really trying to, um, to run a, an operation on a, a shoestring budget that it feels like at some point in the future, we're going to get to the stage where we're going to be able to address all of these concerns and I'm going to be able to build these systems right, but I just can't do it right now. Um, I just you know, I don't know that it gets easier. And (laughs) that's why having some of this, uh, you know, having more of these conversations more openly so that we don't end up with a bunch of people kind of blundering around thinking they're doing the best that they can when, when some of these, you know, these tools, these questions, these, um, just, uh, the conversations I think could, could be beneficial to, to many. So you can do a lot of good 
and never go on an origin trip. I mean, I think the origin trip yeah. is, some, is yeah. kind of this, well, like you said, a small company thinks, well, we're small and gosh, we can't do that whole, you know, direct trade. We can't do the origin trip, but that's our goal. And, and maybe that mm-hmm. shouldn't be your goal. If you're doing, you can, I mean, can you make just as much of an impact on sustainability, transparency, and the future of coffee without ever visiting a farm? Yeah. And, you know, as something you said earlier reminded me um, that when we started this conversation, we talked about, or I talked about meeting you in the context in, in latte art, you know, and, um, and I think there's a parallel here in as much as like latte art has been, or certainly was maybe in the area where, um, where you were teaching me to do latte art, like this sort of sign of having arrived as a barista, Mm -hmm. like it was a legitimized you and what you were capable of doing. It's, but it's only one indicator, you know, like it, it isn't actually, um, it doesn't make coffee taste better. It doesn't make you a good barista. It's not the, the sort of deciding factor dividing line. It's only one of a suite of skills that is an indicator of someone who has been practicing, who knows what they're doing, who, you know, didn't just start doing this yesterday. And, and even if, well, whatever, even if you did start doing it yesterday, you could still pour like great lattes, you know, I, yeah. just, I don't mean to, uh, to be denigrating newbies in the, in the audience here. Um, <laughs> and, and likewise with the origin trip, you know, it's like, that is, I think that there is a, a certain, um, status associated with it. Like when you get to that point as a, if you work for a company that, um, that sends you to origin and it means something about you. And, um, and that's not all bad. You know, I, that again, is like those milestones, those learning opportunities, investing in someone's growth and development, investing like that, that can be really great. But the sort of perception that you can't be a great coffee person or you can't really, um, appreciate coffee until you do this, or you're not a good coffee buyer if you don't go and, you know, sleep on a farmer's floor, um, and, um, you know, eat street food or, uh, cup 94 coffees only to reject all of them. Um, like those sorts of, it, it's when it becomes disconnected from the, when it, when it takes on maybe more weight than all of the other things that contribute to being a good coffee buyer or roaster or partner or barista or, you know, whatever that, that role is. Mm. It kind of becomes a a vanity in a way. Yeah, it becomes a vanity. And, and, you know, I think there's a, it can be confusing also. Um, because if we, if we take out of our consideration, the examples of the, you know, Costa Rican, um, barista or, uh, you know, finance expert who analyst financial analyst who wants to go visit a coffee farm in Costa Rica on, you know, an origin trip. And we, um, and we think more about the, like the example, potentially the stereotype, I don't know, the trope of the, uh, the coffee buyer from the United States going to Costa Rica. Then, uh, I think that, you know, some of the, the lines can be blurred also. And, and that sort of risk or the, you talked earlier about the, the sort of dark side. And I think that it can be confused by the fact that we have a long history of, you know, going to the tropics for vacation, or we see these as these sort of exotic destinations that are associated with um, relaxation or with something that's, um, you know, the, not, and it's not for everyone, not like everyone has the idea of everyone gets to go to Costa Rica on vacation. But um, I think it would be different if we were coffee was produced in um, Canada, you know, or like <laughs> Norway or Russia or something like that, that I'm not sure that people would go on an origin trip to Russia thinking like, oh, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be beautiful and I'm going to party and I'm going to drink. I mean, maybe you would drink. I don't know. But like uh, there's this because of where it's grown also and uh, and the sort of significance of the tropics i think that leads to some of the like additional layers of problems with with origin trips mm. so kind of something to examine uh motives by and say yeah there's this element that's sort of subconsciously present that treats this like a a recreational experience rather than 
in in investment or business. And and I'm not saying that you have to be all super serious all the time or anything like that. But um, yeah, it's a that's a really great point. I never thought about it that way. Um, so earlier in the conversation, we were talking about there's two groups of people that go to origin for any you know for the reasons of either business or um, you know tourism in a sense, like the competitor going down or uh, the barista. Um, could you give us some practical tips for how we can, you know, kind of kind of a checklist or, or some things that we can keep in mind and even do to make sure it's a mutually beneficial experience for both the one visiting and the one hosting? Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, those two groups have some things in common. Um, to a certain degree, they're both there to to do business or to they have goals around what they want to accomplish. And a little bit uh, like what I was saying earlier, talking about the not conflating a, a trip that um, is some sort of investment in quality with a trip that's about marketing and, and promoting. There's a there are some goals that we could tease apart for either buyers going down to do some sort of business, transact like a specific coffee from a specific group, or a, um, a barista who's going on a trip to learn about coffee production. You know, in both of those cases, if there is a, you know, if there are learning objectives, things you want to accomplish, um, to know what those are so that you can try to accomplish those and not feel disappointed if you don't. Um, but also recognizing and, and maybe even to the extent of asking the host, whoever that host is, what are your goals? You know, what would you like to accomplish while I am here? And for a buyer, that might be, you know, your host might want to take you to visit groups of producers and demonstrate that, you know, they are a a an exporter or a cooperative that knows their buyers and they have access to them because that's, you know, it's a competitive advantage for them, something that they might want to have happen on your trip that you wouldn't have anticipated. So I think asking, and you know, the same may be true for a, a barista coming to visit. The host might want that barista to do a tour of local coffee shops and um, talk about their experience as a co- experiences as a, co- as a competitor. And that would be, um, I think that, you know, in both of those cases, the person who's going on the trip might not have anticipated that request, but it could end up being the, the best part of the trip. Um, if there are goals that don't have to do with business also, like if you're going someplace and you really want to see some um, archaeological ruins or you want to uh, taste some sort of local liquor or you want to go to the beach, then um, that's great. You know, you can combine those things with this trip, but not to necessarily expect them to happen on the trip or feel like uh, even if they happened for another buyer or another barista, that those should be part of your trip. Hmm. So, Hold them you know, when you're hand. there for the educational purpose or the yeah, or the business purpose, um, to be physically and mentally present for that. And then um, to make additional time if uh, if you want to for those non-educational, non-business um, totally legitimate and totally awesome, but, you know, not to be confused, goals of drinking great liquor, going to the beach and seeing ruins and, you know, monkeys and like shopping for trinkets. <laughs> yeah, which sounds great. Sounds fun. Um, that's an excellent point. Yeah, those are all great things to yeah. do. I love doing all of those things. It's, um, but the it can be tricky if you're trying to do them all um you know after a farm visit and then show up at a cupping lab the next day sure you're not in the frame of mind to really you know invest as much as you could have been if you were kind of separating those things out and holding them with an open hand like you're uh, suggesting we do so do you have anything else that you want to share that will help uh people going on origin trips well, one more thing, you know, I, I talked about partnership earlier and wanting to uh, be cognizant of if we're going to use words like partner, then um, let's make sure that we have open conversations about 
how we collectively use our resources as opposed to making those decisions unilaterally. Um, and while I do encourage this move toward partnership and open dialogue, recognizing power dynamics also. And so um, knowing that uh, historically buyers have had and continue to have more power sort of systemically um, than what a buyer asks for or a barista asks for, what the customer asks for, the, um, the host may feel obligated to provide even when there is no uh, no real promise of um, gain from that. Um, so that, that could be a vacation type request, one of those that I was just talking about. But it could even be, and I'm thinking about situations where very enthusiastic people, you know, friends of mine, um, former customers would decide that they wanted to go on a trip to see a farm and they would see their portion of the cost as basically getting themselves to whatever the coffee producing community was and then feel like, and once I get there, it'll be so cheap. It's basically free. Not valuing the, the sort of time investment that would be required um, of someone to, you know, meet them and, uh, and drive them around and show them the farm and, um, and that kind of that hospitality is so freely given, but it isn't free, you know. And so I'm not suggesting that everyone has to like you, you tip your farmer for taking you around the farm or something that's potentially really culturally awkward. But somehow just acknowledging that that time is really meaningful and valuable. And um, and maybe there's a this is just kind of a cultural like a respect that I'm advocating. That's that's a great point. Um, walk circumspectly walk with with humility when you're in those situations that's for sure it can only turn out well for you so as we talk about all this and and this has been a fascinating conversation when we come to origin trips worth it or not worth it i believe this is one of those cases where we're in an awkward phase right now or we're coming to terms with some of the ways that we have mischaracterized origin trips or we have overstepped some of the bounds, maybe offended some people, you know, misused our time. We've had a few bad experiences, but I think that's part of the learning process. And I ultimately do think that origin trips are worth it. Um, I think that if we threw them out as a waste of money, then we would be missing a lot of really valuable opportunities for cultural exchange, for relationship building, for learning uh, on both sides. Um, I think I would like the, I always want to encourage that and, and not just in sending buyers and baristas to producing communities, but I also think that there's value in producing producers and workers going to visit buyers and baristas that for everyone in the coffee value chain to feel recognized and to trust one another, to understand the different roles that different people play. Um, there's no substitute for that in-person time. So if we were to throw out origin trips, I think we'd lose a lot of that. I think we just need to work through what it is that we really want to accomplish, be a little bit more clear from the outset, be a little bit more honest about what we're capable of achieving in a once a year visit for like three days um, and, and what we can't possibly achieve in that time. Um, I think that that will help us to do origin trips better. Well, this has really helped uh, give some great perspective to sort of push the move the needle on a better origin trips for sure. I really appreciate all that you've shared in this conversation. It's I think it's been really helpful. So where can we find uh, different uh, talks that you've given and uh, materials that will help us in our understanding of sustainability that will also just help us, you know, become better at these uh, origin trips? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. So a few of the talks that I've done over the years can be found on the SCA's YouTube channel. 
uh, there's a, a dedicated channel to the RICO Symposium. And since about 2010, I've been speaking there. And for the last four or five years, they've recorded those talks. So um, you can find a, a few different ones about subjects ranging from quality and producer interpretations of how of quality and um, to farm workers. And, uh, and also on the SCA's research site, which was recently redone, there's a series of five papers on critical issues, including gender and water and climate change. And we call them colloquially the white papers. And as a group of five, they're a great resource for anyone who comes to me and says, I'm really interested in sustainability and coffee, but I don't know where to start. What do I need to know? Then saying, read these and then we'll talk because they <laughs> um, they really do set up uh, some of these kind of key considerations. And there are other resources there as well about um, sustainability and then also um, on many other topics because sustainability is only a part of what we uh, of what we do in the conversations that we have here in coffee. Sweet. Wow. Thanks, Kim, yeah. so much for yeah. joining us on the show. It's 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 been a blast. I really appreciate it. I it was I've said this already, but it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, relationships that are mutually beneficial are core to what we do in the cafe. And, you know, that's no less true for the relationship we have with those who produce the coffee we serve. Um, From this talk today, I, I really feel we can approach the opportunity to go to origin with a bit more um, inner preparedness and with a heart and mind ready to serve and prepared ahead of time to not only take value from the trip, but to deliver it to those who are hosting as well. Uh, I love the idea of just asking ahead of time about what they would love as a result of the trip. But it seems like one of the ways that we mess up the most is when we uh, let our assumptions build up momentum in the relationship that could be built as a result of the trip and the value that could be gained is left unrealized. So in the end, origin trips have a ton of value to both parties, but like anything, uh, how we approach it will determine the quality of the result down the line. So if you find yourself on an origin trip, I hope that um, Kim's words today are helpful, help you set up some goals for your trip, really get in the right mindset, and build some relationships and invest into the future of coffee as you go to the origins of coffee. So my thanks to Kim for spending time talking with us about this and helping us fine tune how we approach these opportunities. I will link to a bunch of her lectures in the show notes. Be sure to listen to them all and get those uh, white papers that she was talking about. Um, Those will be linked to in the show notes as well. If you have questions, comments, and feedback and want to contact me directly, please do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. Really happy to hear from you and uh, what's going on in your world. What what kind of problems can I help you solve? Uh, What things can I do to make this show better? Um, The survey for listeners is still out. If you want to partake in that also, that's in the show notes. And it's also, uh, there's a link in the Instagram profile for Keys to the Shop. And Coffee Fest is coming up. I am speaking and judging latte art there. If you're in Baltimore, March 16th through the 18th, come see me. The lectures I'm giving are not only based on what I've experienced in my profession, but they're also things from the show, like um, five keys to a successful cafe, uh, essential elements for effective management, the meaning of money, and a campfire uh, talk on the state of retail. And uh, I think those are really going to be fun talks. And uh, please do, again, introduce yourself. I'd love to shake your hand and chat with you. And that's it for today's show. Thanks again for spending time with me, joining me on this uh, kind of a trip theme last couple of weeks. We had European coffee trip last week, and this week we're talking about origin trips. I'm happy that you decided to take those trips with me. If you get a chance to go to origin, I really hope that the information in this conversation will help you make it a great one. And I also hope that, as always, this episode has given you keys to the shopping.